Hello friends, welcome to another episode of Thinking Backwards. Um, last time I talked about communitarianism and the problems I find with communitarianism, specifically the problems I find with the cultural relativistic thoughts that oftentimes accompanies um, communitarianism. And so today I want to talk to you about something similar, right? Not cultural relativism or communitarianism, but a more specific branch of, of, um, of thought that stems from existentialism, that is the idea of subjective truth or subjective morality, meaning that morality not only is subjective to, to is not only relative to the culture, but relative and subjective to the individual. Right? And we see this in Kierkegaard and um, some, some existentialist thoughts in history. I have a problem with this. The reality is that truth can't be subjective. Right? So when I say truth is subjective, a lot of people think that when the left or when um, philosophers like Sartre, Kierkegaard say that truth is subjective, they mean something like truth, the world, reality itself is subjective. They do mean that in a sense, but they, like not in the sense that we normally think what they mean, we, what we think they mean. So when they say truth is subjective, they don't mean that there's absolutely no objective truth at all, meaning that you know, if I see that an apple is red, it's actually green, and, that's, and that, that truth is subjective. There's a distinction between what they call a factity, which is, or no, a facticity, which is the idea that the, uh, which is the objective reality in the world that we can't change that. The facticity, the factic reality in the world, right? So th there's, there's that aspect and they do acknowledge it, that that exists, that the material world exists around us and that's, that's just objectively true. For them though, what they mean when they say subjective truth is not the facticity, but the, something they call transcendent. And you'll see this in um, Simone de Beauvoir, or a lot of um, second or third wave feminists that uh, that are influenced by Heidegger or some kind of existentialist thought. Facticity and transcendent. The idea that although there is a factic reality surrounding the world or in the surrounding world that we, we inhabit, there's this more transcendent, important truth that we ought to, to consider, which is the transcendent truth or what they call transcendence and that's truth as internalized into the individual praxis or into in the individual purpose the individual the i makes sense of the world and so all truth although there's that factic facticity surrounding us the only truth that actually matters is how we see perceive the world so if you read kierkegaard he uses the example of abraham um, i think it's a re really interesting example and i'll yeah, I wrote about that in a section of my book and I'd love to tackle that, but I'll leave that, um, that conversation for some other time. What I do want to talk about today though is, is the idea of subjective truth. And so if all of truth was subjective, all that would matter is my own subjective perception of reality, even if such was in rivalry with logic and reason. Furthermore, if all that matters is my own subjective perception of truth, and the same would be true for morality. There is no right or wrong except that which I invent for myself. Right or wrong would only then make sense relatively. I can't tell you that what you're doing is morally wrong and vice versa. Even if such action, even if the action concerned is, for example, abortion or the murder of innocence. There's only I approve of or I disapprove of which, as far as another individual is concerned, is morally irrelevant. Interpersonal judgment would be impossible. Social progress, again, we run into the same problems that cultural relativism runs into. Social progress would not make sense. Right, wrong, good, and better presuppose that there is a moral standard which everyone should follow. This means that even for abhorrent things like slavery, the Holocaust, we can only say, I approve or disapprove of it, which if morality is only true subjectively, 
has no moral binding as far as another individual is concerned. Thus, if we look at things like abortion, for an anti-abortion advocate, if truth was really subjective, for an anti-abortion advocate, it would be true that abortion is morally wrong for that person. And for an abortion advocate, it would be true. It would be true that abortion is morally right for that person. And then if they start talking to one another about their respective stances, and then I get so mad and one person gets so mad that he murders the other person for the sake of it. It would be morally right for the murderer to do so if he feels like it. But, you know, many people will say something like, well, you ought to respect the other person's perspective. You know, you ought to respect their freedom of speech, their freedom of religion, and so on. After all, there is no sub objective moral truth. All moral claims are just projections of our emotional approval or disapproval. But this is self-refuting. As demonstrated, should doesn't make any sense. Why should I respect your opinion? Why is respect a virtue? Why is it a virtue? And furthermore, why should we all follow such virtue? If we, if we hold respect to be an objective good or virtue, then again, we are presuming a standard of objective virtues and vices that exist. If truth was subjective, there would be another problem. A person's meaning in life would also be subjective. And the existentialists accept this. I do whatever I want in accordance with who I make myself out to be. I invent my own meaning. Ironically though, if I just drift through life like the crowd, the, exist the existentialists unanimously agree that I am living what they call inauthentically, which basically means that I am not realizing my fullest potential for fulfillment. As the Catholic writer Philip Trower noted, the history of human thought is full of strange alliances, and one of the most surprising is this which has brought what is perhaps the most radically individualistic philosophy ever invented into the service of political collectivism. Sartre and other French existentialists of the left, like Marlo Ponty, have been the principal marriage brokers. To give a real-life example, to demonstrate why subjective truth is so problematic, I'd like to bring up this case that I recently saw um, about this young girl who was on Dr. Phil a few years ago. She made a bunch of striking claims that everybody knew to be false. For example, she said that the rapper Eminem was her father and told Dr. Phil that she had pictures to prove it. She believed herself to be related to Dr. Phil, and she also claimed to be pregnant with baby Jesus. When she first appeared on the show, she was shown an ultrasound to which she replied, I don't care what the home pregnancy test or a doctor says. When I give birth to my baby, no one is going to deny him because he is my savior. But if you actually watch the exchange she had with Dr. Phil, her behavior, to me at least, did not drastically deviate from that of a regular teenager going through puberty. Now you can challenge me on that, but for me, her behavior was, you know, she didn't go around and like smash things. She was pretty normal, except for her obviously outlandish and grotesque claims. Eventually, she was sent to two months of inpatient treatment to help her manage her delusions. When Dr. Phil later asked her why she did not believe the ultrasound at first, she, she explained, at the time, I was so against it because I didn't think it was a real ultrasound, but now I'm looking at it and maybe I should have listened better, but I wasn't about to back down because I really thought I was pregnant. I'm gonna play a clip up here. Well, Haley, it's good to see you again. Thank you, it's good to be here. How are you? Doing a little worse than I was last time. My um, schizophrenia has gotten worse. When you were here last time, you were adamant and certain that you were pregnant. One night, um, I had woken up and I went to the bathroom and then I looked at my stomach, you know, I was feeling around and stuff and my stomach had went completely flat. So I researched it on Google and I was like, what's going on? Why did my stomach go flat to have a miscarriage? And I waited a couple of days, but my stomach just kept getting smaller and smaller. And then I started bleeding. And then I was like, oh my God, I just had a miscarriage. And, but then I, I, I started thinking about it and I was like, nothing came out except blood. 
So, I mean, some, I think the baby would have came out. Mm -hmm. So how do you explain that? I mean, were you not pregnant? No, I wasn't. You weren't pregnant? Uh -huh. Why do you think you thought you were pregnant? Because I've never been pregnant before, and my stomach had swelled up to a very large amount, mm -hmm. and I've never had it swollen up like that before. Uh -huh. um, you were shown an ultrasound when you were here, and it was blank, mm -hmm. and there was no fetus, there was nothing inside, and you rejected that as objective evidence that you were pregnant. How do you feel about that now? At the time, I was so against it because I didn't think it was a real ultrasound, but now I'm looking at it and maybe I should have listened a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't about to back down because I really thought I was pregnant. Sure, yeah. But w when you saw it, you, you thought maybe it wasn't real? Yeah. And in fact, I think you told Dr. Stork to shove it. Yeah, I did. Uh, how do you feel about that? I feel pretty bad about it because mm -hmm. he was just trying to help, but yeah. I, I really believed that I was pregnant, so I wasn't about to back down from it. You know, in this clip, I think it, it's, it shows something important about the relationship between doctors and, and patients. It shows that despite the facticity, the ultrasound showing her, her non-pregnancy, the girl, Haley, was deeply convinced by her subjective experience and chose to view the, ev the evidence presented before her as fake. In this case, Dr. Phil treated her delusions using the factic information she, he had gathered from her, entirely from a third-person perspective, to deny her subjective perception of reality. Should Dr. Phil have respected her subjective perception of, of truth? After all, isn't subjective perception all that matters for a truth to be a truth? One may say that surely, with our knowledge of, of medical science today, we know that her claims were false, plus she was mentally ill, so she couldn't have taken a stance toward her facticity and be transcended. But here's the question, how do we know that she was mentally ill? It might seem like a funny question to ask at first, but it is one that the American Psychiatric Association took seriously. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM-4, read, Although this manual provides a classification of mental disorders, it must be admitted that no definition adequately specifies precise boundaries for the concept of mental disorder. The concept of men mental disorder, like many other concepts in medicine and science, lacks a consistent operational definition that covers all situations. You know, to generalize this, this situation, we can think of the common culture today where we have men who identify as women and vice versa in the name of queer theory or transgenderism. Some of them make a distinction between sex and gender, while others, like Judith Butler, sees no difference between the two at all. Our biology is thus disconnected from the way we ought to act in this world. Man and woman are just ancient expressions and notions of our obsessions with genitalia. Very recently, we even had a British male who identified as a non-binary Korean. Can we say that this person has a false perception of reality? Is this a delusion? What is a Korean anyway? Is it anyone who possesses a Korean passport? If so, this guy does not qualify. If a Korean is just anyone who feels like they should be Korean and were born in the wrong bodies or countries, then he does indeed qualify. This deconstruction of words, insofar as they take on different meanings for different individuals, makes any conceivable reality possible for everyone. Accordingly, nothing means anything except that which, is, which the individual makes of the matter's effect. As the Catholic writer Philip Trower puts it, the word meaningful and existentialist thought does not mean true, right, or intelligible, but what gives the individual satisfaction. As neighbors, we can and should respect each other's experience. But experience on its own cannot be a path to knowledge, especially when separated from, and in some sense, in rivalry with the use of the mind. 
Experience is merely the stuff from which knowledge is derived, unless we think or analyze about our experiences, which necessarily requires the use of abstract ideas or propositions. Our experiences tell us nothing or deceive us. The way we feel about things does not mean that such is how things are. Thank you for listening.